Hello, and welcome to the Fox Ridge Virtual Prescribed Fire Workshop. This is the presentation on grassland management techniques. My name is Julia Kemnitz, and I am a biologist with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program, and I'm located down in southern Indiana. Uh, this presentation is based off a of PowerPoint uh, created by Ryan Owen, who is a Pheasants Forever Quail Forever biologist. So here is our presentation overview. Uh, we're going to go through why grassland management is needed and why we can't just leave these grasslands uh, undisturbed and why disturbance actually helps make them better. Um, We'll go through the different options for management. There's a lot of different techniques out there uh, for managing grasslands, so we will briefly go into each of those. And then the timing for management. Um, since the timing of these different uh, disturbance activities have different effects for the grasslands, we'll go over um, what time of year is best to do some of these management techniques. And then kind of help uh, decide for your field in grassland uh, what management techniques might be the right for you, right way for you, and other resources available with that. So why do we need to manage grasslands? The first reason is to control succession. Uh, naturally, these prairies want to become woodlands, uh, so in order to keep them as grasslands, we need to implement some management strategies. The second reason is to control invasive species. Uh, these have a nasty habit of making it into our grasslands, and so the only way to remove those species is to manage them. And the last reason is to increase diversity. Um, over time, the wildflowers tend to drop out of these prairie plantings, as we will discuss, and so by using these management techniques, we can increase diversity in these prairie plantings. We can improve the cover uh, for wildlife and the food sources as well. So controlling succession. Um, when we're talking about managing native warm season grass plantings, what we're really talking about is this early successional uh, plant community. Uh, so these plantings not only include the grass species such as big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, side oats grandma, switchgrass, but also a diverse wildflower component as well. Um, so we can see that the early successional uh, process, the dandelions and ragweeds, are a really important food source to wildlife. And as we progress, um, these more, the perennial plants, such as the ones we're talking about, come in, and that will progress into a shrub stage. Um, such as you know blackberries and dogwoods, and then you'll see that the windblown trees species tend to come in, like the cottonwoods, ash, maple, and elm. And over time, those species kind of morph into the trees and the mature pines and hardwoods at the end. Um, so when we're talking about the, we're in this presentation, we're focusing on the early succession the fallow ground, grasslands, pollinator habitat, warm season grass, all one of the same. Controlling succession. So these early successional uh, vegetation species, these annual uh, and perennial grasses and wildflowers we've been talking about are essential for numerous wildlife species throughout the year. In the summer, uh, birds such as songbirds, northern bobwhite quail, ring-necked pheasants, uh, they use this habitat for food and shelter. Uh, birds in these areas to build nests, raise broods. Um, in the winter, they use these grasslands for escape and also cover from the elements along with a food source. Um, but there's a variety of other wildlife that use these grasslands too, most for our native species. Um, so, White-tailed deer use these areas heavily uh, for bedding and shelter, and the forbs are also a food source during the summer. Uh, wild turkeys use it as well. And wildflowers are a critical part to these plantings for wildlife, not only for structure, but as a wildlife food source. Uh, pollinators also, they need the nectar sources from early spring to late in the fall. And the monarch butterfly requires um, a species of milkweed, at least, for a larval food source. 
So not only are these native warm season grass plantings beneficial to wildlife, but they also contribute critical ecosystem services as well, including soil retention and enhancing water quality. So another reason uh, we were managing grasslands was to control invasive or undesirable species. Uh, so what's the problem with them? Invasive species can create these large monocultures that reduce populations of native plants. And anytime you have a monoculture of any species, it's going to decrease the wildlife value of that area. Um, this is because the decrease in food source, if there's only one source of food at one certain time of the year, and some species may not even feed on that um, single invasive species. So it really limits the food availability for wildlife. And for some species, when we're talking about cool season grasses, it can really limit the mobility of chicks. So some examples of these invasive species are the noxious weeds, um, Canada thistle, common teasel, poison hemlock, crown vetch. These are all pretty nasty invasives that you do not want in your prairie. And in some states, they're even required by law to remove if they're on your property. Um, this includes the non-native cool season grasses, uh, tall fescue, Kentucky bluegrass, smooth brome, reed canary. Uh, these can all be especially difficult to get out of warm season grass plantings. And then your invasive woody species will also come in, such as the bush honeysuckle, autumn olive, calorie pear, and this is actually a picture taken in Indiana. Um, you can really see all that white is the calorie pear, um, or Bradford pear is another name. Um, so if you see these for sale, please do not buy them. Um, they are very prolific and invade um, prairies and woodlots all over the state. So they can create huge problems. So in controlling invasive and undesirable species, um, if you're doing a new planting or really kind of starting from the ground up, proper site preparation will alleviate a lot of problems down the road. Uh, what you had in your site that you're trying to eliminate is a very good indicator of what is in the seed bank and what has the potential to come up. And different management techniques, as we'll talk about later, um, are really beneficial to some of these invasive and noxious weeds that we're trying to keep out. Uh, so it's really important to know what you're dealing with um, and know that your management techniques are appropriate for eliminating some of the species you're trying to get rid of. The most important part is to not rush your planting. Um, it's very easy to try and just get it in the ground and hope it'll outcompete. Um, really the best way is to eliminate any threats to your prairie before you do any planting. Uh, it's easier to control and it'll pay off in the long run. We need to manage grasslands to increase diversity. In the recent past, native warm season grass plantings were seeded more heavily with grasses, uh, which over time creates dense stands with little value for wildlife. Uh, these plantings only typically contained a few forb species that over time age out of the planting as the grasses became thicker. Um, these, gra these thick grass stands have little value for wildlife. In the summer, there's not enough room for wildlife to move about or raise young. And in the winter, the grasses tend to fall over like you see in this picture, which eliminates the cover that most animals use these grasses for. Um, wildlife requires a diversity of native species for forage, brood cover, and nesting. The more diverse you're planting, the more wildlife species can benefit from it. So what are my options for managing my native warm season grass planting? Um, we're going to go through a variety of different options. The first being prescribed fire, herbicide treatment and spraying, disking, interseeding, grazing and mowing and then we'll kind of go over a couple of different combinations since rarely do one of these treatments alone effectively manage grasslands and these methods will differ for each native worm season grass planting uh, depending on a lot of the factors we just talked about such as 
what invasive species are present, or what your end objective is going to be, and which of these uh, tools to use that you actually um, have the ability to do. Prescribed fire. Um, it's what it sounds like. It's using fire to burn off existing vegetation with certain set of objectives in mind and in a controlled manner. The key word here is controlled. Um, talk to professionals, get a burn plan. Um, this is a very well thought out, documented and researched process. So you need to make sure that you're doing it safely and within the law. Um, and even though this is naturally a uh, part of a prairie ecosystem. Today, it's not a possible management tool for every stand. So you will have to evaluate uh, your site and see if this is an appropriate management tool. So the pros and cons of prescribed burning. Uh, the pros are that it's very efficient. Um, it removes thatch and opens up bare soil. Uh, it's recycling those nutrients back down into the soil. It can set back or kill woody species that have started to move into your prairie if they aren't already too well established. And it encourages growth of fire adapted species. I mentioned on the last slide that burning has been a part of the ecosystem in Indiana. So the growth or the fire adapted species really respond well when a prescribed fire is implemented. The cons are it has the potential for escape, injury, property damage. That's why it's very important to discuss this with professionals and have a burn plan in place. It can stimulate some unwanted species, such as Cerisia lespedeza. Um, so you need to evaluate before doing a prescribed fire, and maybe if you do have Cerisia lespedeza or some other species that are encouraged by fire, to go in and manage those first uh, to make sure that you don't have a nice patch of Cerisia after you're done burning. Um, it also will not thin very thick grasses in the long term. Uh, the timing of your burn is going to be determined by your overall goals. Uh, typically fall burns favor uh, wildflower growth and can target that woody encroachment. And fire usually needs to be combined with other management tools uh, to thin out grasses. And a prescribed fire by itself isn't usually enough to thin out grasses long term. The next method of management for warm season grass plantings are herbicide treatments and spraying. And this is using herbicides to control or set back vegetation. Uh, the timing is going to be determined by your objective, and there are various application types that we will go over next. But always be sure to follow herbicide labels and to be able to get not only the most effective treatment, but to stay as safe as possible. So the pros and cons of herbicide treatments. Uh, the pros are that it's very effective at controlling small trees and cool season grasses. Um, it's great for setting back thick grasses. Uh, it can be hired out easily by a contractor if you are not able to do it yourself or want to ensure that it is done by a professional. And it is the best option for invasive species. Um, a lot of other techniques can serve to set back invasive species. However, most of them actually need herbicide treatment to be controlled. Uh, the cons is that it requires equipment uh, that not everyone has and it needs to be calibrated and depending on what herbicide you're using for your intended target species, uh, you'll need to have some other uh, materials such as surfactant. Um, so that can be sort of a hassle having to put all of these things together to spray. And it does leave thatch uh, that will need to be taken care of before doing other management activities. So one way that you can implement this herbicide treatment is by strip spraying. Um, and it is generally what it sounds. It's using a broad spectrum herbicide such as glyphosate sprayed into strips that are 30 to 50 feet wide. Uh, so how you implement this is to spray a strip 
and then skip twice the width of that strip you just sprayed, spray again. So you have one in three of the strips sprayed. Then in the second year, you repeat the pattern, spraying half of the untreated strip from the year before. And then by the third year, you would treat that final untreated strip. And what this does is it creates different successional stages in your native warm season grass planting, which is really beneficial to wildlife. Uh, the most recently sprayed strips will have more annuals, uh, such as the ragweed that we discussed earlier, and that is very high quality food, uh, the seeds are for wildlife. And the linear design that you see in the picture provides more edge between treated and untreated areas, uh, which creates closer proximity between that nesting and brood rearing habitat. So another option for herbicide treatment is block spraying. Uh, so this technique is also used to manage thick stands of grass uh, if it's followed with prescribed fire. So dividing the area up into sections and treating one third of the area across three years will have the same effect as the strip spraying. Uh, you're just doing it in blocks instead of strips. Uh, so creating those different successional habitats for wildlife. Um, and this is also using a broad spectrum herbicide. Um, so fire alone will get rid of the thatch, uh, but won't manage the grasses long term. But herbicide treatment is very effective, but it does leave that thatch. Uh, so one potential combination of management techniques is to do a herbicide treatment uh, followed up with a burn once the thatch is able to be burned uh, to eliminate all that cover and get kind of like that bottom picture with some bare dirt present. And then the last option we'll talk about is spot spraying. And this method is the best option for controlling, controlling small infestations of invasive species, um, as opposed to treating an entire area in the other methods. Uh, this method requires vigilance. Uh, you need to know where these invasive species or noxious weeds are in your planting. Um, and you need to catch them early uh, before they spread so you can treat them, but also you need to be able to treat them at the right time of year. Um, another advantage to this is you can use selective herbicides. Um, so there are different, uh, some herbicides target those broad leaves and others target grasses as opposed to glyphosate that will target both of those groups of plants. Uh, you can really get specific in your herbicide choice if you're going after one invasive species uh, to be able to really effectively control it. And then another benefit is you can do a stump treatment, basal bark treatment for woody species, uh, which can be very effective. Um, so with the herbicide treatment and spraying, it's very important overall to identify what your target species are and then being able to match the correct herbicide to these invasive species to be able to effectively control them. So the next management technique we will look at is disking. And this is demonstrated in the picture and it's using soil disturbance to disrupt the roots of the current growing plants and open up bare soil. So the pros and cons of disking. Uh, the pros are it's very effective at controlling small trees uh, since they can get in there and break up those root systems. It's great for setting back uh, thick stands of grass. It promotes annuals like common ragweed and foxtail, which were those great early successional food sources for wildlife. And it's also a great way to make fire breaks uh, since it eliminates any flammable material. The cons, uh, it can bring up invasive weed seed. Uh, whatever is in your seed bank when you're disking has the potential to be exposed and germinate. Uh, so that brings us back to our previous discussion on herbicide use. Um, you need to be ready for invasive weed seed and like we mentioned, what is previously been in the area. Uh, so if you've had a can if you've had Canada thistle around or it used to be in that uh, seed bank, there's potential it can come up so you can prepare um, to treat that seed if it germinates. Um, disking also causes the potential for erosion uh, since that open bare dirt. 
It will not control cool season grasses long term. It does cause some loss in soil organic matter and it has the potential to disturb nests of beneficial ground nesting bees. So one way to utilize disking is to use the same pattern as strip spraying that we had just previously discussed. And this also serves to create the different successional stages of habitat. Uh, so that most recently disked strip uh, will have more of those annuals, uh, so the more seed production for wildlife. A common mistake is not disking heavily enough. Uh, usually one pass is not going to be enough to thoroughly disturb the soil. You're going to need to do this a couple of times to really turn over and disturb those grass root systems so they can be set back. The end result should be about 40 to 60% bare soil. And the timing to doing this disking is really important as well. Um, kind of doing it in the fall to over the winter uh, tends to promote those more desirable wildlife species such as common ragweed. So the next option for managing warm season grasses is interseeding. And this is seeding forbs or legumes into an existing stand of grasses. So the pros and cons of interseeding. Uh, the pros are that it really increases diversity in your native grass planting. Uh, the cons are that it does require site preparation. Uh, you really need that bare dirt component to ensure that these seeds that you're planting have a solid seed soil contact so that they germinate and can outcompete some of these grasses. Another con is that seed can be expensive. Uh, for general wildlife requirements, you're looking at at least five species, uh, one which should be a legume. And then if you're looking to enhance your planting even more for pollinators, uh, you're looking at three species per bloom period. So you're going to want three species of wildflowers that bloom in the early spring, three that are blooming throughout the summer, and three that are blooming throughout that later fall period uh, to make sure that these insects have a continual source of nectar. And then if you're looking at other species, uh, other species such as the monarch butterfly that need a milkweed requirement, um, you want to make sure you have that in there as well. So as we just talked about, to get that really good seed soil contact uh, with the bare dirt, some management activity needs to be performed before interseeding to open up some of that space so these wildflowers have room to germinate. Uh, they could be planted uh, with a no-till drill, such as in the picture, or they can be broadcast seeded. For wildflowers, they are best planted uh, in the dormant season so that they can go through that cold stratification. Um, there are several different native wildflower species that need at least 60 to 90 days in the cold to cold stratify, so they will germinate in the spring. So the highest success rate for these species is to plant them in the fall or over that dormant period um, and not in the spring. But something to consider is not to plant these seeds too deep. Um, with the broadcast seeding, that's less of a concern, but with no-till drill, that is being drilled to a very precise height, and these seeds cannot be planted deeper than one quarter of an inch or they will not germinate. So you really need to take care not to plant these seeds too deep. So interseeding is generally not needed for just general wildlife enhancement. As we've talked about with these different management techniques, um, just doing those disturbance activities will bring in a lot of those native plants that are very beneficial to wildlife. However, if you're looking to really benefit pollinators that are in great need right now, interseeding is a great option. Um, I'm sure Many of you have heard uh, the past couple of years, and even farther than that, that monarch populations have been drastically decreasing, and they've been a huge focus uh, for biologists in the Midwest. And so prairie plantings with an enhanced wildflower component has been very critical um, for these monarchs. So if you can, uh, throw in some milkweed species for the monarch butterfly, since it uses it as its larval food source, and then those three uh, species per bloom period of year that we talked about um, on the previous slides. 
And also interseeding uh, with these native wildflowers is great for aesthetics. Uh, it looks very pretty to have a bunch of different blooming wildflowers. So if you're looking for some color in your native warm season grass planting, this is a great option. So the next option we're gonna talk about is grazing. And our native prairies in Indiana evolved with grazers uh, that are generally absent these days. So um, grazing is a great way to stimulate that native prairie growth. So the pros and cons of grazing. Uh, the pros is that it can keep grasses from dominating and it promotes diversity when these, um, when these large animals are going through and not only foraging but trampling grasses, it really helps to set them back. Uh, it's a great source of forage in the summer for these animals and it, reduce in, or it results in reduced thatch overall and it recycles nutrients. Uh, the cons is that it requires careful management. Um, it needs the right balance of grazers uh, to make sure you're not overgrazing, um, which can, will be detrimental to your native warm season grass sand. But also you want to have enough grazers so that it is having the intended effect of reducing the grass component. And then with grazing, there also is that potential for erosion. So the next method we will talk about is mowing, and that is mechanically cutting back vegetation. Uh, mowing is really useful when it's used in conjunction with some of the other practices we've talked about. Uh, for example, mowing before disking can make it easier to disk, or mowing vegetation to reduce the height or thatch um, and clearing that from your planting before treating with herbicides can make treatment easier and more effective. The pros and cons of mowing. Um, the pros of mowing are that it can keep those tree seedlings down before they get too established into your prairie planting. And as we discussed on the previous slide, uh, mowing can be used in preparation for other methods of uh, managing your warm season grass stand to make those methods more effective. And it's especially useful for establishment of newly planted stands. Uh, when there's a newly planted prairie, mowing is critical to keep down some of those faster growing annual species that you're not necessarily looking for when you're trying to establish a new prairie. And it also really serves to open up um, the sunlight to those seedlings you've planted by keeping those other species down. Uh, the cons are that it can create thatch if you have really tall grass and mow that down real thin. Um, overall, it will not thin those thick grasses out. It just really removes that top growth. Um, it can promote cool season grasses in some instances. And it can smother thatch, or it can smother plants with the thatch, rather, um, if the grass is tall and is not removed from the planting and overall it tends to reduce diversity. So some questions that might be coming up with all of these techniques of removing all of this habitat for wildlife is won't removing the cover be bad for these wildlife species we're trying to benefit? Um, the answer that is that the timing and the amount of disturbance are absolutely key to this. Um, the most beneficial thing you can do is not to conduct maintenance or management uh, during nesting season uh, from April to August and really making sure that you're not disrupting those ground nesting birds and other wildlife species uh, such as pollinators. Any of these activities will destroy their food source. Um, and with all of the methods we talked about with like strip spraying or sp strip disking, uh, don't disturb the entire area at one time. Um, that way you're always leaving some of the total area for wildlife um, and therefore lessening the effects of these management activities on them. That being said, we really need to think about some of these off-target species uh, that we're not managing specifically for. So not those white-tailed deer or the bobwhite quail or those grassland songbirds but those other species that we are impacting by potentially by these management actions. Uh, so pollinators, we talked about if you're 
mowing during certain times of the year when these species are in bloom that they're using for nectar sources. Uh, that can be detrimental to them. Um, so avoiding doing management activities during the growing season like that. Uh, bats, uh, the, some tree species uh, cutting during the winter instead of in the summer when bats can be using it for uh, roost trees. Um, and then other species like salamanders, snakes, turtles, um, these actions can be affecting these guys as well. So you want to take into account all of those other critters that are in or around your prairie planting um, to really minimize the effects to them as much as possible. And that happens to be the dormant season. Um, that's when these guys are less active or underground um, or in caves. So that is generally the best time to avoid conflicts. So what are the best options for my fields? We've talked about all of these different management techniques. Um, and so now it's time to figure out what the best one for you is. Uh, so there are a lot of different things that need to be taken into consideration before making a complete and thorough plan of how to manage your native warm season grass stands. Uh, one of the first things is, are you enrolled in a program? Uh, did you plant your grass stand through NRCS or FSA? Are you enrolled in CRP? Uh, are you in the Partners for Fish and Wildlife program? Uh, did you go through the Department of Natural Resources? Uh, these programs have specific protocols and guidelines of what you can do to manage these grass stands and in what time of year. Uh, so check with your program um, and make sure you're staying in compliance with any of those uh, requirements that they have. Uh, what species are you trying to promote? Uh, you know, like what we talked about with the pollinators, if you're really trying to focus on pollinators, um, interseeding might be a great option. Um, and so kind of planning those management activities to maybe uh, disturb that native warm season grass planting and then do an interseeding. Uh, what are the issues? Do you have invasive species issues? Um, you need to be ready to tackle those or tackle those before you have started doing um, some of these other management techniques. Um, an erosion prone site. If you have fields that are prone to erosion, uh, you don't want to be exposing this bare dirt. Uh, so disking might not be the best option for you. Uh, what equipment do you have or have access to? All of these management techniques we talked about uses some form of equipment, um, some more available than others, uh, such as mowing might be a very easy option for you. However, uh, a no-till drill might not be as accessible. Um, maybe you don't have one, your neighbor doesn't have one, uh, your local soil and water conservation district doesn't have one. Uh, so see what equipment you have available to you um, or that you can hire out, contract uh, to get done. So that might dictate what you choose as your management techniques. And that also relates to what your budget is. Um, we talked about interseeding, um, and that can be as pricey as you would like it to be. Um, so uh, just really evaluating how much time and money and resources you're willing to put into these fields. Um, and there is no one method that is going to be best for everyone's field. Uh, everyone has different, um, different pressures, different constraints that they're working with. Um, so feel free to explore several different options to see which one fits your field. Uh, so continuing off that, um, you know, we've talked about a lot of these different practices in conjunction together are generally the best bet instead of using one practice by itself. Um, so you might want to figure out a way to link a couple of these practices together to get the most effective management techniques, uh, such as, you know, mowing and burning or um, mowing and spraying. Uh, you're going to need to kind of evaluate what different options put together are the best way to manage your, your plans. Um, if you're ever in doubt, there are a lot of experts out here um, willing to help you. Um, or if you just even need a second opinion or you've run into some issues, um, there's several different sources. Um, 
U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we're always here to help um, doing private lands plantings and um, management plans. Your Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever biologist. Um, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, uh, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, uh, any local context you may have. Uh, there are a lot of options and we are out there and ready to help. So please reach out. Another really valuable tool um, is the internet, online resources. Uh, Purdue Extension, among many others, are is a very valuable resource and they have extensive publications on managing native warm season grass fields. Uh, so look those up, um, read those, and it has an amazing amount of information from experts that and studies uh, that will be really helpful. Uh, if you're thinking about implementing a new prairie stand, native warm season grass and pollinator stand, uh, there are several things you need to take into account as well. Uh, proper planning and site preparation are key. Um, the most important thing that you can do for your future prairie is to eliminate as many issues and do as thorough of a site prep job as possible. Um, it will really pay off in the long run uh, when you don't have to battle some of these invasive species or other undesirable plants. Um, if it's possible, leave areas next to wood unplanted and allow a soft edge to fill in. Kind of creating that transition zone for wildlife is very beneficial. Um, again, make sure you kill all of the current cover or weed problems so that your seeds that you plant in your new prairie have a the best chance they can at germination. Um, and kind of the theme of today's presentation is don't plant too much grass. Um, <laughs> you don't want to create too much of a grass dominated stand, uh, which would increase over the years. Um, so consult uh, with, a, with native seed nurseries or professionals to get a seed mix created that has the appropriate balance of forbs to grass for what your goal of the planting is. And uh, make sure you encourage those perennial forbs. Uh, we've really emphasized that they're important to these native warm season grass plantings and really beneficial for wildlife. So make sure you include those in there. Uh, some closing thoughts. Uh, don't be afraid to try something different. Uh, it could lead to some really great results. Um, and diversity is really key for managing wildlife. Um, the, the more diversity in management techniques uh, brings more diversity in landscape composition, which brings more diversity in the plant community, which brings more diversity in cover, which leads to diversity in food resources, which will bring you your diversity in wildlife. Uh, so really keep that in mind when you're selecting the best habitat management tools. So thank you guys for joining me um, on this brief introductory overview to managing native warm season grass plantings. Um, I hope there was some useful information out there and there's definitely a lot more. Uh, so please consult um, your professionals and um, those online resources. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out um, to Julia Chemnitz at fishandwildlifeservice.gov and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.